thanks to the organizers um, and Dr. Radhakrishnan for inviting me to give this talk on coronary artery disease and chronic kidney disease and update. These are my um, conflicts. I'm on the executive steering committee of Akibia, which is doing uh, randomized trials of treatments uh, for anemia. The funds are paid to Tufts Medical Center, and I've been a consultant uh, to Cordurian. So the goals of my talk are gonna be as follows. I'm gonna discuss the epidemiology of coronary artery disease as well as cardiovascular disease in general um, in CKD, dialysis, and uh, very briefly transplants. Transplant is um, um, too much to discuss, I think, in this um, session. I'll discuss the prevalence and incidence of CKD in, in CKD as well as dialysis. I'll discuss types of CVD at different stages of uh, CKD, risk factors for coronary artery disease, presentation of CAD and how it's different in patients with CKD. I'll briefly discuss risk equations for development of coronary artery disease and compare them to Framingham risk equations. I'll discuss uh, screening for uh, coronary artery disease in the presence of CKD. I'll then move on to some of the pathology and what we understand about pathology of coronary artery disease in CKD and end the talk with prevention and treatment of coronary artery disease. Throughout the talk, I'll discuss what is known um, as well as potential ideas for future research, what is not known as yet. So when we start off in this field, I think the first, uh, one of the first things that we recognized already uh, a couple of decades ago, and there were several studies that um, showed this, was that a decline in GFR is a risk factor for uh, development of coronary artery disease. This is one example from the atherosclerosis community in community study um, where we evaluated 15,000 patients and um, evaluated the future probability of developing coronary artery disease. And what you can see in the orange curve um, is that the predicted probability increased dramatically as the GFR declined, you know, somewhere between 60 to 90, but then exponentially increased. And even if one adjusts for all the risk factors um, that are prevalent in, um, that, that have a higher prevalence in chronic kidney disease, the, pre the presence of CKD was still a risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease. And that's in the, in the blue curve. Um, so GFR is a strong risk factor for development of cardiovascular disease, and that's now well recognized. Uh, the other component of CKD is albuminuria. And one of the first studies to evaluate this was um, the PREVENT study, which was uh, conducted in the Netherlands, approximately 40,000 patients who sent in 24-hour urine collections. Um, and what they did was they evaluated the, um, in each patient, they assessed the level of proteinuria and then evaluated risk factors uh, for development of coronary disease, or in this case, cardiovascular death in follow-up. And what you can see in this slide is that there was a linear relationship between the um, level of albumin concentration and development of cardiovascular disease. Importantly, this risk increases throughout uh, the levels of albuminuria. In the gray shaped, uh, in the gray area, that's uh, microalbuminuria between 30 milligram per gram and 300 milligram per gram. You can see there's a linear increase and the increase is actually even present in those with um, zero milligrams to 30 milligrams. So it's a linear relationship throughout this uh, range of albuminuria. So both albuminuria and reduced GFR are powerful risk factors uh, for development of coronary artery disease. And this was data from the Chronic Kidney Disease Prognosis Consortium, as many as 105,000 patients. And what you can see is that albuminuria and reduced GFR are independent risk factors. So in each particular figure, um, 
with outcomes including all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, ESRD, acute kidney injury, and progressive kidney disease. The red, green, and black are the different levels of albuminuria, and on the x-axis are different levels of GFR. And what you can see is that these are independent risk factors and on top of each other. So they're telling us different um, uh, factors that are predisposing patients to uh, coronary artery disease risk or cardiovascular risk. In each figure, um, you see parallel associations with higher levels of albuminuria and the risk increasing as GFR declines. When you look at dialysis patients, this is data of ours already from more than 20 years ago and it's looking at cardiovascular mortality in the general population compared to those, in, those treated by dialysis. The whole top part of the curve is dialysis patients. And on the y-axis, you've got annual mortality on a log scale um, due to cardiovascular mortality. And what you can see is that the ages of 25 to 34 there's approximately a 500-fold increased mortality due to cardiovascular disease if you're a dialysis patient. It doesn't matter if you're black, uh, white, male, or female dialysis patient, there's just a tremendously higher risk. And even in those who are greater than the age of 85, there's um, a three-fold higher risk. So that a dialysis patient who's at the age of 25 to 34 has an equivalent risk to a, a patient in the general population who's at about 85 years of age. So just tre tremendous cardiovascular mortality in patients who have kidney failure. When we talk about dialysis patients and acute myocardial infarction, what you can see over here is you can define myocardial infarction by a ST elevation MI or a non-ST elevation MI. And what you can see is that from 1993 to 2008, the period prevalent uh, rates of non-ST elevation MIs have increased um, significantly. And some may argue, you know, is this due to better troponins measurements, et cetera, and just us picking up minor um, uh, myocardial infarctions. And that may be partially true, but if you look at what's happened to these patients after they non-ST elevation or MI or the ST elevation MI. On the left-hand side of the curve, what you can see is um, from 1993 to 2008, there's actually been no improvement in the probability um, of death following these uh, MIs with non-ST elevation MI. And as you would expect, there has been some improvement over these years with improvement with ST elevation MIs in on the right-hand side of the curve. So these non-ST elevation MIs, even if they, you know, low level increases in troponins, and, you know, I'm not gonna discuss in this talk how we define uh, MI in a, in a dialysis patient, but it, you know, it has to be a, a troponin that goes up and then goes down. But all these troponins that are going up and down, even to low levels are associated with um, adverse um, prognosis. If you look at the temporal trends in coronary vascularization procedures among dialysis patients from 1997 to 2009, it's as you would expect. Um, what you can see is that as time has gone on, there's a higher prevalence of patients who are using stents. And in the light green over here are the drug eluting stents and they've particularly increased um, over time. The bare metal stents in the dark green um, have kind of stayed stable, but definitely decreased from the early 2000s. And the percentage of patients who are undergoing cabbage um, are obviously um, have decreased in comparison with these um, use, use of stents. So this is just epidemiology of how the patients are getting uh, managed uh, when they have their coronary revascularization. So I'm now gonna move into the types of cardiovascular disease at different stages um, of CKD and risk factors for CVD. So I like to think of cardiovascular disease in CKD comprising multiple different aspects of the cardiovascular system. There's cardiomyopathy, which can include eccentric LVH, which means the ventricle gets thicker, but the diameter also gets 
uh, wider. And that's, you know, risk factors like anemia, you know, uh, volume overload, high cardiac output, et cetera. Then there's concentric LVH, which is a thickened ventricle, but the, the cavity is not dilated. And this is, you know, you think of aortic stenosis, hypertension as risk factors for this. There's a tremendous amount of cardiomyopathy and as patients reach dialysis, as many as 75% of them already have LVH. We're gonna focus primarily on atherosclerosis and coronary disease. And atherosclerosis, you know, uh, can also uh, causes ischemic heart disease. And this can be large vessel coronary artery disease, which we can intervene, you know, with uh, percutaneous interventions. But there's important to recognize there's also ischemic heart disease without large vessel coronary disease. This is small vessel disease in the setting of LVH and patients get ischemia and have MIs and they do just as poorly. Then there's large vessel arterial remodeling. This is of the aorta, um, stiffening of the blood vessels, you know, causing hypertension, LVH, perhaps uh, decreased diastolic filling. And then there's also a high prevalence of al valvular disease. Like I said, in this talk, we're gonna primarily focus on um, uh, coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis. When we talk about cardiovascular risk during CKD progression, on the bottom part of this curve, I think it's important to recognize that as your CKD gets worse, there's a higher risk for all types of cardiovascular outcomes. So the risk of fatality after that CVD event increases as your kidney function declines. I think it's important to recognize as we now move to the top part of the curve, that as your kidney function declines, we're not only dealing with atherosclerotic CVD events. So your classic myocardial infarction, angina, um, un unstable angina, acute coronary syndromes, et cetera. You start having a much higher prevalence of other types of cardiovascular disease that cause problems. And these include you know, high prevalence of LVH, sudden cardiac death becomes a bigger issue. You start getting, as I said, arteriosclerosis and stiffening of the blood vessels. And there becomes a tremendous amount of heart failure, particularly as patients uh, reach um, end-stage kidney disease. And the patients are often dying, not from an atherosclerotic or myocardial infarction, but progressive cardiomyopathy and, and uh, arrhythmias and sudden death. When we think about risk factors, in general, we think about traditional coronary risk factors as defined in the Framingham population. And these, we all know, these are hypertension. In kidney disease, I primarily talk about dyslipidemia because dialysis patients don't tend to have high um, total cholesterol levels, but they have dyslipidemia with low HDL cholesterol, or high oxidized LDL cholesterol. So there's dyslipidemia. There's obviously a tremendous amount of diabetes. Our patients are older. Uh, there's a lot of physical inactivity. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of LVH, um, et cetera. So traditional risk factors are highly prevalent in kidney disease. We also really consider non-traditional risk factors in, in kidney disease that are playing a role. Some of these are unique risk factors to patients with kidney disease. These include things like elevated calcium phosphorus and parathyroid hormone and anemia. But then there are also risk factors that are present in the general population, but are just at much higher prevalence in patients with kidney disease. So this is oxidant stress, you know, high LPA, homocysteine, thrombogenic factors, inflammation. You know, these are all thought to be risk factors also in the general population, but just a much higher prevalence in patients with kidney disease. So we should be considering both traditional and non-traditional risk factors um, as risk factors for coronary disease in CKD. So as I said, throughout this talk, I'm gonna discuss future areas of research um, where you know, the areas that we can still learn more. And part of this was uh, part of a KDGO conference that we published in Jack last year. So I mentioned some of these areas of research as we go through. One was the prevalence of CED by angiography in incident dialysis patients. We don't really know these kind of numbers because a lot of patients are only getting catheterization, of course, if they're symptomatic. So we don't have a good idea in a general 
uh, close to dialysis patients how much coronary artery disease itself they are. We need, we need to continue doing population-based cohorts of individuals with kidney disease at late stages. This is examples of the CRIC, German Chronic Kidney Disease Study, and even earlier than that, example studies from Kaiser to discuss longitudinal CAD outcomes in CKD. We need to standardize and differentiate among the different clinical endpoints because they, they probably have different risk factors. And you know, composites have been done in these studies, but many of these composites include um, outcomes that have very different mechanisms. E examples include you know, atherosclerotic mechanisms versus arrhythmogenic mechanisms versus heart failure mechanisms of causing um, CVD. And then also uh, frequency of sudden death as an initial presentation. We don't have that as a great, uh, we don't know much of that in, in CKD. So I'm now going to talk about presentation of uh, CAD in CKD. So what we know is the following, that patients with CKD, and in several studies, this has been defined as you know, CKD stage 3D, less than 45 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared. These patients are much more likely to present with acute myocardial infarction versus stable angina in comparison to those without CKD. So it turns out as the kidney disease progresses, for whatever reason, they actually presenting more frequently with a, a acute myocardial infarction. I think it's important to recognize that as your CKD advances, particularly in end-stage kidney disease, they're likely to have atypical presentations. So there are several studies that have shown this. They're less likely to have chest pain, more likely to have shortness of breath, vague symptoms, um, and a lot of this is thought to be autonomic dysfunction, you know, that's highly prevalent in patients with advanced CKD, many of them who may have diabetes, et cetera. And more likely also to have non-diagnostic EKGs or ECGs. With advancing CKD, there's also a higher likelihood of presenting with non-ST elevation MI versus ST elevation MI. And I'll hint at potential reasons for this a little bit later as we talk about the pathology. So what are future research uh, with regard to this? Studies of pathophysiology of different uh, differential symptomatology, you know, understanding this autonomic dysfunction a little bit better, accuracy of EKG changes uh, for diagnosis of acute uh, MI and CKD. We've got, uh, I think, uh, work to do in there pathophysiology and optimal workup for intradialytic hypotension. I think as part of our con, uh, controversies group, there was some question as whether some of this, you know, intradialytic hypotension may reflect, you know, coronary disease or small vessel disease or some type of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, we need additional mechanistic studies. I think uh, people have all heard about uh, some of the studies of myocardial stunning, particularly occurring during um, hemodialysis, and how this relates to uh, coronary um, events in the future. I'm now going to discuss risk equations. So in the general population, we have risk equations that have been devel uh, developed primarily in the Framingham population, but you know um, other cohorts as well, to predict the risk of coronary disease in the future. So when we look at cardiac and mortality events during, due to the presence of CKD, and these are data from multiple um, cohort studies, um, including you know, ARIC, um, CHS, Framingham study, what you can see is in the left-hand side, it's the risk of developing of cardiovascular disease. And um, what you can see is the white bars are smoking, the um, gray bars are diabetes, and the black are, are CKD. And if you look at these different groups of um, patients, white men, black men, white woman, black woman, you can see how important the presence of CKD is for predicting future cardiovascular disease. So particularly in black men and black women, CKD is a much stronger risk factor than diabetes or smoking. And this is true both for CVD in the left-hand panel, as well as uh, for mortality. 
when we start to look at how good is the Framingham predictive instrument in CKD, this is data of ours also looking at patients with CKD from these various cohorts. And what you can see in the bars are the blue are the observed events in these different cohorts. In the kind of orange color or pink color is the predict events, predicted events using uh, Framingham risk equations non-calibrated. And then if we recalibrate, we can get a closer estimate um, in, the, in the red bars. And what you can see, if, if you look at men in particular, and if you take a look at the right-hand side, uh, sorry, the left panel in men, but the fifth quartile in the right-hand side, you can see that there's very poor um, correlation between the observed events and the predicted events um, when you use the Framingham risk equation. And this is um, five-year probability or 10-year probability. And the probable reason for this is that there's a high competing risk of mortality in patients with CKD. So if you look, if you use a Framingham risk equation to predict events, it's not great at predicting coronary events, particularly in men, because a lot of the patients with CKD will die from other causes even before they develop that um, coronary event. In women, it's a little bit better, but again, you see the bars don't um, correlate as strongly as you would like. So the conclusion from this is like, if you just use the, the classic Framingham predictive instrument, it has very poor discrimination and calibration in patients with CKD. In dialysis patients, you see this um, reverse causation where the best um, systolic blood pressure is approximately 160 to 170, and there's higher risk above that and below that. Again, the exact cause of this is not known, but it's probably reverse causation due to a higher prevalence of cardiomyopathy, perhaps malnutrition as your blood pressure um, declines. So if we summarize this uh, for CKD before dialysis, we clearly need studies to adapt widely accepted ASCVD risk predictors to CKD. We, we need to add the CKD specific terms. So ACR and EGFR will improve prediction. And then we probably need to refit models. In other words, change the coefficients of some of the risk factors, which may have different relationships in CKD. For example, blood pressure, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, et cetera. And then the question is whether we add novel markers and you know, are they measured routinely? These could include things like troponin, BNP, markers of bone and mineral metabolism. In end-stage kidney disease, we would need completely new equations because clearly um, we can't use uh, blood pressure and cholesterol, which have you know, opposite relationships to the uh, general population. And should we add, um, and, and should these equations be focused on different endpoints, which probably have different risk factors? Could have for myocardial infarction, sudden death, and heart failure. Um, with regard to transplant, there have been some equations that have been developed, but I don't think any of them have been validated post-transplant, and I'm happy to discuss more on that in the question and answer session. So I'm now gonna to move to screening for CAD and CKD. So this is one example of a randomized trial that was done in type two diabetics and published in JAMA already more than 10 years ago. 1,100 patients with type two diabetes and randomized them to screening versus no screening for CAD. And what you can see in the left-hand panel was that there was no difference in the cumulative incidence of cardiac events. If you look on the right-hand panel, clearly if you had an abnormal um, imaging study um, or screening test, you did worse, but that didn't result in, if you intervened on that, that you do better. So CAD screening and CKD to summarize, clearly coronary disease is common and serious in asymptomatic CKD patients. Screening tests for asymptomatic CAD appear to be less discriminating and effective in CKD and stage kidney disease and post-transplant. And I can discuss some of these studies. I don't, I don't have the time to go over them, but they not as good as the general population. There's no evidence that coronary revascularization is effective in any asymptomatic po population, let alone more effective. Screening for CAD is not recommended either in the general population or high-risk populations. 
And uh, as part of our controversy conference, we did state that screening for CAD is not recommended in CKD. Screening may, however, be justified in candidates for kidney transplant. And again, I'd be happy to uh, elaborate on that more in um, question and answer sessions. So let's talk a little bit about pathology now. So this is a nice um, review that was published in Jack in the last couple of years. And it looks at the different types of calcification and by plaque type. And on the left-hand side of the, the figure are more um, um, stable, um, excuse me, are, are, are more less calcified um, plaques and plaques that may be a little bit more unstable and a higher tendency to erosion. So on the right-hand side, you're gonna have using all different measures to evaluate histology and radiographic uh, assessment. You're gonna have very calcified plaques, nodular plaques, diffuse uh, um, calcification by uh, at autopsy, calcific high calcification by EBCT. And when you look at the clinical outcomes, it seems like those patients with the more calcified lesions set, tend to be a little bit more stable, have more heart failure, and have whole, a higher amount of multi, uh, multiple multi-vessel coronary disease. On the left-hand side tend to be the ones that maybe have one vessel disease and in some ways, you know, younger, younger patients, but also potentially at higher risk for, for rupture. Our patients with kidney disease have a lot of calcified plaques, more advanced plaques, so would more likely fit on the right-hand side of this curve, but I don't think this has been particularly studied in kidney disease. If we talk about acute coronary syndromes, um, this is another figure that was uh, in an editorial by Libby Adal in European Heart Journal, and talking about the different types of acute coronary syndromes, one being you know, a plaque rupture on the right-hand side of the curve, which is your classic red thrombus, and more frequently likely causing ST elevation MIs. And on the left side is the white thrombus, and this is a, an erosion, you know, different pathophysiology for these different types of uh, myocardial infarctions. And the question is, are there differences in CKD compared to non-CKD, particularly with regard to this? And I don't think there've been detailed studies of this, but in general, I would think clinically I'm, much more frequently seeing, you know, uh, non-ST elevation uh, MIs in our dialysis patients, and perhaps we've seen a higher proportion of erosions, which is not necessarily associated with a better prognosis than these uh, than these uh, ruptures in our patients with CKD. But this is something to compare in patients with CKD and non-CKD in future studies. So future research, we'd need additional autopsy studies. Is the increased calcification of the media in coronaries with CKD? Believe it or not, this is still argued when we discussed this at our controversy conference. It's not clear that there's increased calcification in those blood vessels. What's the mechanism of sudden death? Is it ischemic? Is it primarily arrhythmogenic? Studies targeting inflammation and senescence in CKD to prevent calcification. What is the frequency of plaque erosion, as I discussed earlier, versus plaque rupture? across the CKD spectrum, how does this relate to type one or type two MI, um, et cetera. And are dis different dialysis modalities associated with different uh, risk factor for different coronary events, yeah, HD, frequent HD, intermittent HD, nocturnal HD, uh, do those uh, versus PD um, affect uh, these different coronary events? So I'm now gonna move into prevention and treatment of coronary disease. So I'll start with prevention. And this is obviously a big topic. And I'm just gonna focus on statins, blood pressure targets and SGL2 inhibitors and focus on some of the big trials in these areas. And I think the first thing to emphasize, and this although is an old slide already from 2004, it's been reproduced um, you know, over the years in the recent, most recent one being in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine in 2016, showing that kidney disease trials are unfortunately one of the lowest 
in other specialties of internal medicine. So we don't unfortunately have the randomized trials to help us with the management. We're clearly getting much better and I'm excited about progress over the last few years, but we're still too low in the randomized trials. So that limits some of our evidence base. If we talk about um, dialysis patients, this was the 4D study, uh, 20 milligram of atorvastatin versus placebo in 1200 um, diabetic dialysis patients, no benefit of atorvastatin. Similarly, in dialysis patients, the um, Aurora study is showing no evidence of rosuvastatin um, versus placebo, 2,700 um, dialysis patients. If we talk about earlier stages of CKD, we come to the, um, the SHARP trial, and this did show a benefit. So this included approximately 6,000 patients with CKD before dialysis and approximately 3,000 on dialysis. And this was simvastatin and azetamide versus placebo. And we saw a 17% um, decrease in risk with azetamibe and simvastatin for a major atherosclerotic event. There was no benefit in the dialysis patients, um, although also no interaction between dialysis and non-dialysis, which has caused some controversy as to whether the statins are beneficial in dialysis patients. These are the dyslipidemia recommendations by KDGO. Statins are clearly the lipid agent of choice. Treat all patients with CKD stages three to five, not on dialysis, which age is greater than 50 with a statin. No targets are recommended. You just put them on the agent. On the agent. And there's no evidence to initiate treatment in those on dialysis based on 4D, um, um, Aurora, and the dialysis group of SHARP. But in those who were treated in CKD, they should remain on the statins. I would say that last part is still controversial. I think I would still treat patients who are potential transplant recipients. I would still put patients on statins who've had a myocardial, or who've had a coronary event. For prevention, I think it's a little bit less clear. When we talk about blood pressure target, we're all aware of the sprint, which showed a benefit of uh, SBP less than 120 versus less than 140. And if you look at the CKD subgroup of, of the trial, there was no interaction compared to the non-CKD group. So the benefit of a target blood pressure less than 120 was true also in those with um, CKD. So um, we'll see the new blood pressure guidelines are gonna come out in the, in the next, uh, at least the KDGO blood pressure guidelines will come, in, come out in the next uh, uh, month or two. Um, if you talk about SGL2 inhibitors, we've seen some great data, both for kidney protection, as well as cardiovascular protection on the left-hand panel is DAPA CKD, which was just published. You know, this included patients with CKD all the way down to a GFR of 25 could be included. And it included diabetics and non-diabetics. And there was a, uh, for the primary composite outcome, which included both kidney outcomes as well as hard kidney outcomes, as well as cardiovascular outcomes, there was a 39% decrease in risk. And similarly, on the right-hand panel, when you're talking, talking about primarily cardiovascular causes um, in the Credence trial published a year ago, also a benefit this time of canagliflozin uh, versus placebo. So these um, meds are clearly of benefit for uh, cardiovascular outcomes and um, kidney outcomes in those patients with CKD. When we talk about treatment of uh, CAD, and this is the last uh, part of my talk, let's, let's initially talk about what's known in non-CKD, so in the general population. So if you look at the ACC AHA 2014 guidelines, if you've got stable coronary disease, in other words, um, when would you consist, uh, consider revascularization? If you had persistent angina despite optimal medical therapy, and if you've got there may be some benefit in those with left main disease, three vessel disease, those with you know, uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction, et cetera. If you've got um, non-ST elevation MI or ACS, acute coronary sy um, syndromes, in general, there's a benefit for early invasive therapy if, if refractory angina or hemodynamic instabilities. 
but they particularly say, assuming you have no comorbidities like CKD. And interestingly enough, early invasive strategy was not recommended if you have renal failure because risks likely outweigh benefits. Now, this is a very weak recommendation, 3C recommendation. And invasive strategy is reasonable in those with the earlier stages of CKD and a little bit stronger recommendation. In ST elevation MI, all patients should get early invasive uh, therapy. So let's talk about some of the data in CKD and dialysis. So if you talk about dialysis patients, all we have comparing uh, cabbage versus PCI are observational studies. So important to take that into account right from the outset. And if you look at these curves, this is data from uh, Tara Chang, the blue is those patients who get PCI and the red are those who get cabbage. And what you can see is in the immediately post the cabbage, there's a little bit higher uh, event probability. So the red is a little bit below the blue curve. But as you move out over time, there's a benefit for cabbage versus PCI. So this is trying to adjust, but recognizing that this is an observational study. In CKD, earlier stages before dialysis, we have a little bit better data, but also no, no randomized trials that have compared PCI versus cabbage. So if you look at risk of mortality with cabbage compared to PCI, and this is a meta-analysis of RCTs, and in this uh, table, I've got overall those with preserved kidney function and those with stage three to five CKD. And what you can see is there's no benefit of cabbage versus PCI in any of these patients. If, however, you look at the outcome of risk of MI rather than risk of mortality, what you start seeing is that if you actually randomize to cabbage, there's a lower risk of MI in future. And interestingly, that was only present in the patients with CKD three to five. If you look at risk of repeat vascularization uh, for cabbage compared with PCI and CKD, and you look at all these groups, there's a benefit in all the patients, right? Overall, those with preserved kidney function and those with CKD for um, uh, having a lower risk of revascularization if you have the cabbage, and that uh, clinically uh, makes sense. So let's summarize what we know in these stages, in CKD stages three to five. In the short term, there's a higher risk of death, stroke, and acute kidney injury with cabbage versus PCI. But long-term, similar risks of death but higher risk of MI and repeat revascularization with PCI when compared with cabbage. This is the best data we have. In dialysis short term, also higher risk of death and stroke with cabbage versus PCI, but in the longer term, lower risk of death, MI, and repeat revascularization with cabbage when compared with the PCI. Um, these data are mainly um, from non-randomized studies. So that's the important thing. So we all sub they're all subject to selection bias, and we've got to be very careful in the interpretation of that. So revascularization, what is known? In the gray, I'm going to give a little bit more information because in the last few years, we have more information of this. What is optimal therapy in CKD and end-stage kidney disease? Um, radial access for cabbage and PCI. And then these things in white, we really don't have, uh, we really don't know. In, non-ST elevation MI, what's the value of early invasive strategy in CKD? What are the outcomes of PCI versus cabbage? Progression to ESRD, mortality, CVD outcomes. PCI versus cabbage for left main disease. You know, what is the end-stage renal disease prognosis in dialysis patients? And in CKD, what's the risk of AKI or CKD progression based on, you know, these different methods of treating the revascularization? So we've made some progress and have a nice randomized trial called the ischemia CKD trial. And this included patients with GFR less than 30 or on dialysis, and they were randomized. They had a stress test that was positive, and they were randomized to optimal medical therapy plus cath plus optimal revascularization versus conservative strategy, which was just optimal me medical therapy. And you only got a cath if you failed optimal medical therapy. And this is the result of that trial that was published in the New England Journal this year, that there's no benefit that if you have ischemia on a stress test to going ahead with your optimal, uh, with, with revascularization. 
and there's some pros and cons to to the trial and uh, you know exactly who it applies to i'm happy to discuss in the question and answer thing but you can see these curves are completely superimposed on each other so a nice bit of work that adds to the literature if you think about risks and benefits of radial access for cabbage so you can um, you know you're going to use your uh, mammary artery for one vessel for the cabbage but you can use the radial artery versus the saphenous vein as an additional uh, blood vessel for cabbage and this was a randomized trial um, excuse me a, a composite of several randomized trials looking at radial access versus um, uh, saphenous vein access and those patients who got radial access if you look at the left hand side of the curve did better than those who got saphenous vein access for um, for the bypass graft. Interestingly, however, if you look at the right side of the curve, there was an interaction uh, with CKD. If you had renal insufficiency, which was defined as a creatinine greater than 1.5 milligram per deciliter, you actually did a little bit worse if you got the radial artery. And I think we all know I don't think we understand the reasons for this difference, and it's obviously a small amount of patients. It's not clear if it's uh, a statistical thing or a chance thing, but clearly with, as you, uh, you develop progressive kidney disease, your radial arteries are critical for your dialysis access. So I think, I, I don't know the exact answer for this, but clearly this needs to be individual decision-making on these patients, because you could potentially lose a dialysis access I don't think we understand how catheterization, um, which I'll get to in the next slide. And clearly, if you use the radial artery for a cabbage, you can't use it for uh, a dialysis access, which is a precious resource in, in patients with end-stage kidney disease. If you look at radial versus femoral access for catheterization in acute coronary syndromes, this is also being studied. And this on the left-hand side, is a Lancet paper in 2015, 8,000 patients were randomized to one versus the other. And the event, cumulative event rate was lower and statistically different if you got the uh, radial access for, for your catheterization in acute coronary syndromes. And then there's a follow-up paper looking at acute kidney injury in follow-up in these randomized groups and those patients who got um, radial catheterization um, had a lower incidence of acute kidney injury than those um, who got um, femoral access for catheterization. So these are a few studies, you know, suggesting radial artery catheterization and, and useful bypass may be beneficial, but I think these are things that need further study, particularly in patients with advanced CKD. So what are future research in these areas? CKD-specific trials of revascularization in acute coronary syndromes. We need clearly patient-centric approaches for management strategies. Um, nephrologists need to be discussing with cardiologists you know, how to uh, manage their patients. Um, I didn't go into this in too much detail. You know, when to be using bare metal stents, when to be using drug-eluting stents. What are the risks of putting dialysis patients on Plavix for extended periods? They obviously bleed more, but they also at higher risk for clotting and restenosis. So um, this is where individual decision making is required, and additional studies are, are, are necessary. You know, could we be using um, you know shorter periods of uh, Plavix uh, management in in patients who are getting drug eluting stents, etc. CKD-specific data on use of radial aspects for PCI. I discussed that in briefly a few, uh, uh, a few studies for that. And then CKD-specific data on multi-arterial grafts in CKD and advanced uh, um, and, and dialysis patients. So I'm going to conclude with that. Um, there's a high incidence, prevalence, and case fatality due to coronary artery disease in patients with all stages of CKD. We should clearly be focusing on traditional and non-traditional CAD um, risk factors, and we should be doing research into the non-traditional risk factors and, and intervening on them. We clearly need to intervene on the traditional risk factors in the earlier stages of CKD to prevent coronary disease. 
we need to recognize this different presentation and different pathology in these patients and do more studies um, to understand the differences and hopefully lead to different interventions that can improve prognosis in patients with CKD. There's an absence of validated risk prediction equations for CAD and CKD. There's a lot of research going on on this and you'll see newer studies coming out on this. Unfortunately, we still have too few randomized controlled trials focusing on CKD and, and CAD and CKD, but again, we're getting better with this and I uh, see a brighter future from this standpoint. And we need to always incorporate patients and uh, you know, several teams into making decisions regarding our complex um, dialysis and advanced CKD uh, patients. Thank you.